Hello, everyone, and welcome to Outpatient OT. I am jumping on here to explain stability. I just posted a stability PDF on the portal um, in the OT store. And so if those, of, if those um, of you who have seen it have messaged me asking about stability and what is the difference between balance and stability and why is it important to, to know as an occupational therapy practitioner, I'm going to be explaining um, what that is very quickly um, here today. And so let's just jump right in. So we are talking about uh, stability and stability and balance are not the same. They're very closely related, but they're not the same. So balance is the ability for um, your body to maintain equilibrium. So what that means is your body remains centered and it remains upright. It remains um, right. You remain safe and upright against the weight of gravity, um, whether you're sitting or standing, whether it's static or dynamic, um, but you are not moving. So it's equilibrium without velocity, without any kind of acceleration. So that's balance. So when you're talking about movement and functional ambulation, so moving from point A to point B, um, you are experiencing stability versus experiencing balance. So stability is your body's ability to um, maintain equilibrium through acceleration. Now, when you look at uh, when someone comes into treatment, for example, and we say, okay, we need to work on, we definitely need to work on balance. So my, my patient can't sit upright without falling over because those postural support muscles, they just are not refined. Uh, tone is not, um, uh, is not, uh, sufficient enough to remain upright, causing uh, lateral lean, anterior, posterior lean, whatever that may be. So we need to work on static sitting, just sitting upright at the edge of bed or edge of the mat table. And then of course, we're going to grade that and we're going to include a Dyna disc. We're going to including, we're going to include um, uh, forward you know, return those writing reactions. We're going to start incorporating some of those those body functions so that we are also improving the structures that are supporting the human body. Now we can progress into static, static standing, uh, dynamic standing balance. Um, balance being the key word there. Well, what happens when somebody is in movement? What happens when our patient wants to perform an occupation that requires functional ambulation, functional transfers, ascending, descending stairs? That's where we want to talk about uh, factors of stability. How can we increase a patient's stability? So we've already worked on balance and their balance is good, right? Their balance is a five, right? Let's just say that. Their balance is a good rating. So now we can move into factors of stability, working on coordination, uh, gross coordination, gross stability, um, agility, uh, being able to coordinate your movements through uh, acceleration, so forward motion. And that's that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. So the PDF that you guys have uh, goes over six factors of stability. The first one is lowering your center of gravity. So you know lower to the the lower to the ground you are, the lower to the ground your center of gravity is, the more stable you become. So sometimes when uh, we feel like we're going to fall, we 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 don't even think about it, but we like crouch. And that's, that's unfortunately does us a disservice when um, we are uh, trying to maneuver through our environmental context, especially for individuals with Parkinson's or Lewy body dementia. If their body already kind of succumbs to that weight of gravity into a forward flexion um, and a kyphosis, a forward head, right? Um, if the body is already moving in that direction against the weight of gravity, now we're feeling more imbalanced as well. So our, our balance 
um, perception, our perceived balance confidence has decreased. And that perception causes us to kind of crouch widen our base of support, like we're going to talk about in a second, and kind of get lower to the ground. So now, instead of trying to maintain our posture, we're intentionally moving ourselves closer so that we feel more stable. So lowering your center of gravity, another example of this is um, I think about snowboarding. When I learned to snowboard as an adult, my center of gravity, because I'm a taller person, is higher than that of a child. So I would look over and I would see this like five-year-old zipping down the hill. I don't know if you've ever gone to the slopes and you see uh, these children zipping down the hill, whether skiing or snowboarding, because they're more stable. They feel more stable. They're lower to the ground. Their center of gravity is lower to the ground and therefore um, they have probably higher perceived confidence than we do as an adult being higher. Think about my husband who's six, seven. Um, if he was on a snowboard, right, he's going to feel a lot more insecure, a lot more unstable than myself, who's five, seven. So uh, that's the first that's the first one, lowering your center of gravity, moving lower to the ground, teaching our patients um, that strategy. The next one is keep your center of gravity and line of gravity in your base of support. So we know all of these things are separate. When school, we learn center of gravity over base of support. We all draw that out, right? We all draw COG, line, BOS, and that's something that we are um, seeking to maintain for our clients as we help them regain their balance, which is, right, with without acceleration. So it could be static or dynamic, but it does not require acceleration. And so in order to achieve balance, you have to have your center of gravity over your base of support. Now, when you um, superimpose mobility onto that, then you need to ensure that your center of gravity, wherever it may be, whatever activity you're analyzing, wherever that person's center of gravity is, you draw a line from the center of gravity to the ground, that's your line of gravity. And we need to make sure that the base of support is covering that line. So if you find that person's center of gravity, it changes based on the, the, the action they're performing. You find their center of gravity, you draw a line in your mind's eye, right, straight down, and you need to ensure that straight up, um, that line is within that individual's base of support. Um, so that's, so how can we explain that to our patient? Um, always center yourself, and that's kind of what I have my patients do as I, I teach balance and then um, we start to incorporate and integrate movement into that, um, we center ourselves. So we visualize, there's a lot of, there's a lot of research right now on visualizations, right? And so saying, okay, I want you to draw a line in the center of your body right now, whether you're standing on one foot, whether you're leaning, whether you're standing on an uneven surface, whatever it might be, where is the center of your body? I want you to find it in your mind's eye. Now draw a line straight down, and I want you to center yourself around that line that you see in your head. Go ahead and center yourself around that. The we does a great job at doing this uh, because when you're standing on that board, um, that this might be an archaic example, but um, I guess you can use really any kind of balance um, equipment. Uh, so um, I'm trying to think of that, that balance machine. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank right now, but you guys know what I'm talking about. If you work in MRU or SNF, you step onto this balance equipment and the dot appears and you can you kind of gravitate around this dot, right? Center of gravity. So if you find that dot, if you visualize that dot and you center around that, that's gonna help your patients remain more stable. Next one, focus on a spot. Use focal points. You can teach your patient to do this whenever you're training balance and stability within a treatment session. How do you train them to use a focal point? You create the focal point. We have dots, we have photos around our clinic space so that when we're working on these balance and stability activities, um, they can focus on an object. When I'm working with someone who's been diagnosed with Parkinson's and we're um, doing gait training um, and we're learning how to remain upright with a strong posture during functional ambulation, 
that focal point is crucial. It drives stability and it allows them to remain aligned with the height, right? If, if your height remains in neutral, if your spine, postural alignment is everything, if you're able to remain in that postural alignment, then your center of gravity um, will increase its potential to remain in within your base of support. If you lose sight of that and you're not focused on that, your posture kind of sweeps down, and you kind of start folding, well then your center of gravity is now gonna shift, which means your line of gravity is going to shift. It's going to move outside of your base of support, um, which is stability measure number two, right? So focusing on a spot allows you to really harness all of your postural muscles and remain in alignment um, so that you can remain upright. So it's gonna help your balance and stability. The next one was tricky, increase the mass. So what does that mean? Um, on the PDF, it says greater mass equals greater stability. That goes without saying, right? So if you have a 200 pound, so when I when we talk, remember weight and pounds, our weight and mass is not the same thing. Weight incorporates the force of gravity um, along with the mass, right? Well, mass is the amount of space something takes up. So weight does not equal mass, although mass is directly proportional to weight. So taking, keeping that in mind. If you think about stability, and we, we talk about weight for a second, weight incorporates mass, correct? Um, somebody with a larger weight, which is a larger mass, is going to be more stable than somebody with lesser mass, right? Think about Newton's second law of, of uh, motion, acceleration. Um, something with greater mass is going to take is going to take more force to accelerate versus something with lighter mass or smaller mass, um, which is going to require less force to accelerate at the same speed. So if a 200 pound woman or 200 pound male and a 100 pound male are in the field, <laughs> stupid example, are in the field, I don't know what kind of field, but there you go, and a gust of wind at 80 miles an hour comes, who's going to be more um, unstable? It's going to be the individual with less mass. They're both gonna fall over because an 80 mile, um, an hour gust of wind is insane. Um, but you get what I'm saying here. Another appropriate example um, for occupational therapy is um, really external objects. So when we think about durable medical equipment, somebody with um, somebody with a four-wheeled rolling walker that's 20 pounds is going to um, find that that's more sturdy and it makes them more stable especially if they're moving elevations, than somebody with a lightweight two-wheeled walker that you can just kind of pick up and go. And we've all seen examples of this in the clinic where are in wherever setting you are in of individuals who just literally, quite literally, pick up their walker instead of using it functionally, they kind of just pick it up and place it wherever it is that they want to go. That is an example of an unstable piece of equipment versus these big these big guys, these four-wheeled walkers that are very, very sturdy. Um, uh, there are some also some examples of how you can adapt to that, um, increase the stability of the walker by putting weights on the walker itself to make it more sturdy um, and keep it grounded more, which increases the stability of our patient. Um, and then another example would be teaching our clients um, what chairs they should use when they're doing their balance home exercise programs. You're not going to want a lightweight chair um, if you're trying to be stable while you're standing. You want to have a, a, a larger chair, something with more mass. Um, you want to have something that's more solid than just a lightweight, like arm, uh, a, a lightweight chair that scoots really easy, you want something with greater mass, something with more stability. Number five, increase your base of support. I think we all know that. The wider you stand, the more stable you are. Um, teaching somebody how to, uh, in the winter, we say walk like a penguin. 
awful, right? Awful habit to get into. But when you're trying to be more stable, you're going to lengthen your base of support and walk lower to the ground. Um, and those are both tips that we give to individuals trying to remain upright while moving in winter. So if you think about that, widening your base of support is going to make you more stable. You also think of equipment, right? A four-wheeled walker or a two-wheeled walker. I really don't like four-wheeled walkers. Two-wheeled walkers are going to be a lot more stable than a cane um, because it has a wider base of support. And then finally, uh, number six is increased friction between object and surface. So occupational therapy, um, occupational therapy practitioners have mastered the ability to use the forces of nature, both um, primary, external, and secondary, external, to be able to help somebody achieve uh, functional mobility um, and to improve those factors. So we know friction can either work in our favor or work against um, our patient's outcomes. So how can, um, so increasing friction sometimes does cause, um, does impede outcomes. But in this case, increased friction between object and surface actually makes something more stable. An example of this would be gloves when somebody um, is reliant on wheelchair mobility. You're going to increase friction um, between the hand and the wheel by wearing gloves. Um, that's one example. Another one is cutting some dysum, putting it under a plate so it doesn't slide. If you have um, a a non or um, a grounded anti-slip, sorry, anti-slip rugs that increases the friction so that it's not sliding all over the place. If you're in a work environment where you're constantly walking on wet floors, you wanna wear rubber sole shoes so that you're not slipping all over the place. Um, using rubber fingertips when flipping books and uh, flipping pages in a book or managing money for individuals with uh, peripheral neuropathy. That's also going to be a strategy on how we're going to leverage friction to be able to increase occupational performance. So those are the six factors of increasing stability and how you can use that, how you can teach your clients um, how to increase their stability by using these six factors within every treatment session. Education is so important. You cannot over-educate educate your patients. You can't over-educate your clients. Um, you're, you're helping them and you're giving them the tools to live. And that's our job. So that is it for me today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, go ahead. And um, if you want more videos, check us out in the portal or follow us on YouTube. All right. Bye.